So our consideration then this evening is of the man Moses, a character who, for me personally, has been of particular interest. And this evening we're looking at him in a slightly different way. I think it was the West Bromwich Ecclesia were undertaking a series looking at different biblical characters viewed through the divinely inspired lens of the book of Hebrews. It gives us a slightly different bent, doesn't it? A slightly different focus, a slightly different angle to those particular characters. And although this evening we will be, of course, dipping back into the original historical account, for the most part we'll be looking at Hebrews uh, chapter 11, and additionally the inspired words uh, in Acts chapter 7 also. Those words, of course, of Stephen in his speech, which help us with our understanding. And from the outset this evening, it's interesting to note, isn't it, quite particularly, that Moses, in the Hebrew letter, was, of course, associated with law, wasn't he? And not necessarily with faith itself. And yet his good report recorded for us here in Hebrews chapter 11 is indeed founded on the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, quite literally, as we shall see. And I don't know whether we picked up on this, but it's interesting here in Hebrews chapter 11 that the first thing noted about Moses In verse 23 is the actions of his parents. He had, brothers and sisters, faithful foundations, didn't he, on the which to build. Come with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23. Let's pick up the account here. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23. By faith, Moses when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. You see here, the actions of his parents are very important, aren't they? The comments here of who I believe was the Apostle Paul here who is writing under inspiration give us, don't they, an insight into the account of the Exodus. Now, if we just had the historical record in Exodus, what would we learn of the account of the early life and the birth of Moses? Well, we would suggest that we would learn that there was this boy who was born to particularly loving parents that he was a lovely child, and therefore they hid him from the king. And when the threat of getting caught became too great, they put him in the river, perhaps, and hoped for the best. That is what we could take if we just had the historical account in Exodus. But we don't do, we have this lens through which to view this man's life here in Hebrews. We note, don't we, that it was despite the king's commandment that these things came to pass. It wasn't out of fear, was it, that these things were done. Yes, of course they would have loved their child. No doubt anyone with children would have done the same out of love to protect them. But Hebrews tells us quite clearly that it wasn't just fear, was it, here, It wasn't even just the love of that child that drove them to do what they did. This was an act of faith, verse 23 tells us. They saw that he was a proper child, it said, didn't it, there in that verse? That he was fair, perhaps. He was handsome in some way. The root of this word seems to have a connection with the idea of destiny. In Exodus chapter 2 and verse 2, in the historical account, we learn that he was a goodly child, wasn't he? Now that is the Hebrew word tobai, and that doesn't particularly help us, really, because that word's used in a wide variety of contexts, and it usually meaning to be good. 
But as we intimated earlier, Acts chapter 7 is also another very interesting passage which we can use and is most helpful on this occasion. If we could just turn back there, this is of course the account of Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7 and provides some additional insight here as well. And it helps our understanding particularly in the context here of Moses' faith and the faith that was abounding at that time. Stephen makes the same point here. It's Acts chapter 7 and looking at verse 20. So that's Acts uh, chapter 7 and looking at verse 20 and going into the account here in, in Stephen's speech, in which time, verse 20 of Acts chapter 7, Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. He was exceeding fair, it says, doesn't it, here? There was something different about this boy. There was something which stood him out as being special in some way. The only other place that this Greek word here occurs, this, this phrase that's used here, uh, this boy, in Acts chapter 7, is only used in one other place. And it's the same context. It's to do with being exceeding fair. And the margin here gives us, I think, perhaps an insight. It's not a literal translation, but I think it gives a sense of the word. If you look in the margin there, if you've got an AV margin against verse 20 of Acts 7, it says that he was fair to God, doesn't it? There was something about him. There was a sense of destiny to that child. And it was that which drove those parents. Not, not fear of the king, not just that powerful emotion of love, was it? It was faith. And in fact, I think here in Acts 7 and verse 20, the RSV translates that phrase, exceeding fair, as beautiful before God. So if that was the case then, brothers and sisters... What do we make of the following verse here in Acts chapter 7 and verse 21? What does this tell us? And when he, that is Moses, was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took, took him up and nourished him for her own son. If they hid that child by faith then... On what basis was he then cast out, uh, as that verse 21 seems to intimate? C come back to verse 19 for a second. Uh, here, verse 19. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live, it says there. So what happened then? Did Moses' parents' faith wane after three months? We don't think so, do we, brothers and sisters? It's why it's very important here that we consider carefully the words that are used here. The word used in connection to Moses in verse 21, that phrase, cast out, is in fact a very different word to that used in verse 19, talking about cast out that they might not live. The word here in verse 21 is a very particular word in reference to Moses. It's only used four times in the New Testament, and all of those times it's used in Acts. So if we've got our Bibles out, let's come forward and see where else it's used. It gives us an indication of the meaning, doesn't it? Acts chapter 11, if you will, to start with, and going in at verse 4. The context here isn't important. We're looking particularly for one word. But Peter, Acts 11 and verse 4, rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying. And it's that word expounded there that's used in Acts chapter 11 and verse 4 that is the same word used in relation to Moses there in terms of being cast out. Again, another occurrence of this same word is in Acts and chapter 18. Again, just a few pages further on. Uh, Acts 18 and verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they 
took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. There's our word again, expounded. I'm getting the idea now, brothers and sisters, if we come finally to the last occurrence of this word in Acts chapter 28, right at the end of Acts, Acts chapter 28, and this time verse 23, we see this word again. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him unto his lodgings, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. The word used back in Acts chapter 7 and verse 21 for Moses being cast out is actually that word expounded. And the idea of expounded, of course, is to set something out on a mission. We speak, don't we, of expounding the word of God. In doing so, we are setting out God's plan and purpose, his mission with his son and the earth, the movement of his word in bringing about that plan through them. And in fact, Rotherham uh, and the RSV have a far better translation of that phrase cast out in Acts 7 and verse 21. They literally say, show him. The point is, Moses wasn't cast out, brothers and sisters. Moses was exposed. He was set forth. And that changes our view somewhat, doesn't it, here, regarding the faith of Moses' parents. They didn't just throw him in the bulrushes and hope for the best, brothers and sisters. He was deliberately set forth by his parents to be seen near where Pharaoh's daughter came down to the river. They had a plan set out by faith, brothers and sisters. And and in the Exodus account, we see, don't we, that Miriam is there after those three months with Pharaoh's daughter to give up that appeal. He was there in those bulrushes because of faith backed by the power of the almighty God, wasn't he? They left the matter in God's hands, didn't they? And that's an important point, isn't it, for us? Especially in these difficult, unnerving and uncertain times in which we live. You see, this is where all matters that prove too difficult for us should be left in God's hands. Think about what Moses' parents did. They did what they could. They made a clear plan, didn't they? And they did what they could in faith. And then secondly, what they could not do They prayerfully left in God's hands those things which he alone can perform. And it may be, brothers and sisters, that during this pandemic, these difficult times, we may feel that our faith is weak. We may wonder, perhaps, if God is really there caring for us in the difficulties of these times. If that is you, brother, sister... Remember Moses. He was left in a river, wasn't he, by his parents. And see in him God's deliverance from what was humanly impossible. You see, this is how God works, doesn't he? We know, don't we, that that river there was intended at the time, historically, to be a means of death for those children. They were all taken and thrown into that river to die. And yet in Moses' case, because of faith, that river became a means of preserving life and not destroying it when faith is sure. And this is how God works, isn't it? It's the same with the grave, isn't it, brothers and sisters? The grave, when seen through the eye of faith, becomes a path, doesn't it, to preserving life, as it were. And we see their faith, brothers and sisters, and we wonder at it, don't we? And it's Brother Roger Lewis who makes a wonderful point here in relation to Moses' parents, to Amram and to Jochebed. Because their faith is never forgotten by the Almighty God. In fact, it becomes almost impregnated into the history of Israel at this particular time. 
We may well be aware that Amram means exalted people, and Jochebed, of course, is Yahweh honoured. Open, if you will, if you come back for a moment, to, to Exodus chapter 14, and let's see how these two people are impregnated into the history of this time of the children of Israel. Exodus uh, chapter 14. Remembering in the back of our minds, if we can, the meaning of those two names. And here we have Jochebed a number of times in Exodus 14. Exodus 14 and going in at verse 4. Exodus 14 and verse 4. This is the Lord God speaking and he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honoured upon Pharaoh and upon all his host that the Egyptians may know that I am Yahweh. And they did so. And there it is, brothers and sisters. There's Jochebed. Yahweh honoured, it says. And again, verse 17 of this same chapter 14 of Exodus. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, the Lord God says, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honour upon Pharaoh. And upon all his host, and upon his chariots, and upon his horse. And there it is again, brothers and sisters. Yahweh honoured Jochebed. And again in the following verse, verse 18. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I have gotten me honour upon Pharaoh. And here it is, time and time again. Repeated through the history of this time is Jochebed. And if we just turn over the page, just for one example of Amram, of course, exalted people. Exodus 15 and verse 1. This is, of course, the, the song of Moses even. Exodus 15 and verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He is become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation, my father's God, and I will exalt him. And through God, of course, Israel became that exalted people, Amram. And here they are, these two giants of faith, impregnated into the history of this time. So by faith, the lawgiver came to a position of deliverance and in that deliverance saw the father's power the lord god's in heaven and woven into these times is a character of faith of amram and jochebed if we come back then to, to hebrews uh, chapter 11 let's continue with the account here uh, in this lens here this inspired lens of the life of moses hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24 by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And we see here, don't we, that he had come to years. Uh, the historical account in Exodus chapter 2 tells us that when Moses was grown, he became an adult, didn't he, brothers and sisters? And we may think, well, that's interesting. There's an interesting historical note here. But there's not a word wasted, is there, in the word of life? Come with me, if you will, once again, back to Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7. Keeping a marker, if we can, in, in Hebrews 11, and coming back to Acts chapter 7. And this time, verse 23, because we get another snippet of information here revealed to us. And this is of particular import to uh, the letter to the Hebrews as well. Acts chapter 7 and verse 23, we learn here, Acts chapter 7 and verse 23, and when he, that is Moses, was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Nothing is wasted, is it, in the word, brothers and sisters. At the time of writing to the Hebrews, they were about 40 years old in the truth. And under inspiration here, when we put these things together, the point being made is that they should have now come to maturity in the truth. Come with me to, to Hebrews chapter 5, because this obviously gives us a comment here, doesn't it, on this also. Hebrews chapter 5, and going in at verse 12. Hebrews chapter 5, 
and verse 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which, is, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of the milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You see, Moses had come, hadn't he, to full age, no longer being fed by the milk, but the strong meat of the word. Why is this point being made? Well, Paul, under inspiration, is showing that once Moses was full 40 years old, once he was grown, once he was of full age, once he had come to years, as all the accounts state, it was at that particular time that Moses made a decision. He had the faith to make that sure decision. And we should exhort one another daily, shouldn't we, with that same decision that Moses made. Back in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24. This was a decision that Moses made. Hebrews 11 verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, verse 24 of Hebrews 11, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, there's no definite article, is there, in the Greek? What Moses refused here was an official title. To be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter was a title that could have been bestowed upon him. And just as Moses came to this point when he was full 40 years old, so too the recipients of the letters of the Hebrews had a choice to make as well regarding their sonship were they going to remain the sons and daughters of the living god or were they going to go back to the synagogue to become jewish sons you see it was a choice and verse 25 here in hebrews uh, chapter 11 reiterates that point verse 25 of hebrews 11 choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of god than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season and the point there of choosing is the point of having chosen once and for all. It was a clear-cut choice, a clear-cut decision. It was a clear-cut decision for Moses, and now it was a clear-cut decision also for those who were receiving the letter to the Hebrews. And it's the same choice for us, isn't it, brothers and sisters, in the face of the world? Once we have espoused the things of the truth, it has to be a clear-cut choice. There is no going back. And we think for a moment, don't we, about the situation that Moses found himself in. He was at the very heart, wasn't he, of the grandeur of Egypt at that particular time. He could have reached out his hand and taken anything that he wanted. He could have accepted Pharaoh's daughter as his mother, couldn't he? It would be very easy, wouldn't it, at that point, for the flesh to have given in. While way away there on the banks of the Nile, sitting by the flesh pots, were the slaves. While he had everything he could have possibly wanted. While they were degraded by the whips of those taskmasters in that day. And the point is this, Moses made one decision, didn't he, brothers and sisters, at this point? He turned, didn't he, to Egypt... And said, these are my people, you are not. And that should be our attitude, shouldn't it, to the truth in the face of the world around us. And we have time, don't we, at the moment to practice our separation from the world around us. Let's use that time well, brothers and sisters, to practice it. So that when things return to some semblance of normality, we can retain that separation and not be drawn into the world too much once more. And you see, soon the question would come, wouldn't it, as we've intimated to the Hebrews, were you going to belong to, to that synagogue or are you going to belong to that ecclesia? It is time to make that decision. 
And Moses here chose, didn't he, to suffer affliction with the people of God. It's a phrase that crops up, isn't it, time and time and time again in Hebrews. The people, the people who believed, they were the people of God. And Moses did believe, didn't he? And he accepted with one act. He never gave in, did he, to being labelled the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Why? We've read it, haven't we, already in verse 25. He did not enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And the idea there of for a season is the idea of for the occasion only, isn't it? And of course he had an occasion. He was there in the middle of Pharaoh's house, in the middle of Pharaoh's court in Egypt. But that was it, brothers and sisters. He saw, didn't he, all around him the monuments that were built, those great pyramids, perhaps. Those pyramids for who? Those pyramids for the dead. Egypt worshipped death, didn't they? That They believed, didn't they, that people went on living after they died. Everything was buried with them. Everywhere Moses went, he saw their worship finalised in death. They glorified it, didn't they? Indeed, Moses had an occasion to have part with the glory of Egypt, but he saw, didn't he, quite clearly that they were dead. The pleasures of sin terminated there and then in death. And perhaps the words in, in the second of Corinthians and chapter four ring out to us if we could just turn there. Second of Corinthians uh, chapter four, we know the words well, I'm sure. 2 Corinthians four and looking at uh, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18 we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal and there we have that idea don't we of for a season the pleasure of sin for a season those were the things that were temporal the things that were for a moment only and why was that the case and here we come to the crux of the matter don't we back in hebrews chapter 11 and verse 26 this is why he chose to suffer affliction rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season this is why verse 26 because he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward, it says, doesn't it, quite clearly there. The treasures in Egypt. As we've said, Moses could, brothers and sisters, have reached out his hand. He could have taken it, the treasures of Egypt. He had power over those treasures. Moses stood, didn't he, to be heir of all of that. But he didn't want it, did he? He didn't want it. Because he esteemed the reproach of Christ as greater riches. And the idea here of esteeming carries the connotation, doesn't it, or, or of putting first. Or, or putting to the head, perhaps, as the literal should be. And the idea here is the leading out of the mind. It's setting of the mind in one particular direction. We know Matthew 6 well, don't we? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness first, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's being of single mind, putting first, brothers and sisters, at the head, at the lead, the reproach of Christ. And why, we may ask, is the title of Christ used in particular here in Hebrews chapter 11? Nothing is wasted, is it? The title Christ is used. We're well aware, aren't we, that the Messiah came as the embodiment of the shadow. Here we're talking about, aren't we, Moses' understanding of the reproach of Messiah that was to come. Moses understanding where he was heading. Moses understanding of whom he was the type. 
Deuteronomy 18 comes to mind, doesn't it? I will raise me up a prophet like unto you, it says, doesn't it, there? And in fact, in Acts chapter 7, once again, again, keep a marker in Hebrews 11 if we can, come to Acts chapter 7, these inspired words of Stephen once more, and verses 24 and 25, it's even more explicit here, actually. Acts chapter 7, and going in at verse 24. And this is the, the commentary, isn't it, on the account of um, the, the two uh, brethren here who are being uh, smitten by the Egyptian. And, of course, Moses goes and smites the Egyptian, doesn't he? Verse 24 of Acts chapter 7. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. And here's the point, verse 25. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not, it says there, doesn't it? He supposed his brethren would understand he would deliver them. And that is why, I think, that word Christ is used in Hebrews. Moses thought the people would understand that through him, God would deliver his people. That's what Messiah was coming for. There's a clear perception, isn't there, here, of God's purpose being outworked through himself, which would then, through that shadow, grow in God's purpose through time into the Messiah. Christ is never used loosely, is it? Come with me, if you will, while we're, we're still back in Acts, into Acts chapter 2, just for a moment. Acts uh, chapter 2 and verse 30 and here's the point acts chapter 2 and verse 30 therefore being a prophet acts 2 verse 30 and knowing that god had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up christ to sit on his throne it says here and the point here that, that the word christ is used is that whoever messiah even if they didn't believe at that point that it was Jesus, whoever he was, he had to be a resurrected man. And therefore, that title is used, Christ. And if Moses was insulted for his belief in the coming of Christ, then he enacted it, didn't he? In type, through his life. This was counted as a treasure far above those treasures of Egypt, to suffer for the hope of Israel. And why is that the case? Well, it's back in Hebrews chapter 11, isn't it, once again? We've already read it, but in verse 26. Because he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And that word recompense there is translated, it seems, quite accurately by Rotherham to mean to look away to. And the idea here is that Moses looked away to the reward, didn't he? As we said, he made that choice. He turned away from all that glittering gold and all the treasures in Egypt. And he looked away from all of that and he saw afar off a treasure exceeding all of those things in Egypt. And how often, brothers and sisters, are we called to do that in our lives? How often are we called to look away from the riches and the treasures of this world unto something afar off, something wonderful, that sure hope that we have? And so often we find, don't we, that the flesh strives against this very principle. And the point is this, that Moses was far, far away from Egypt in his mind as we should so strive to be too. And the idea here of the recompense is, is picked up a little later on. It's, it's a play on words, in fact, in Hebrews uh, chapter 12 and verse 2, um, where it says, looking unto Jesus. And again, it's the same idea here. And Rotherham, in fact, translates it the same here in chapter 2 of Hebrews 12. Looking away unto Jesus is the point that Rotherham makes. And in the context here, we've seen the account here in the Hebrews chapter 11 of all of those faithful of old. And yet, 
They are all shadows of him who was to come. All of those in Hebrews 11, great though they were, in one respect all failed, didn't they? They all sinned. And now when we come into chapter 12 and verse 2, the point that is made here is now, having looked at all those examples, now we look away unto Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. And so... Moses came through that temptation. He forsook Egypt. He was surrounded by the wealth of the world. He was the heir to it all and he looked away. What an incredible man of faith, brothers and sisters. What an example to us. Back in Hebrews chapter 11 then, I'm picking up the account now in verse 27. By faith, he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Fascinating verse, isn't it, brothers and sisters? He forsook Egypt and he didn't fear the wrath of the king. In a way, this is the second time, isn't it, that Moses forsook Egypt. This time he utterly forsook it. He bodily left Egypt, as it were. His mind had left a long time ago, as we've already said. He looked away, and now he follows that mind bodily out of Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. And, and that is a wonderful phrase, isn't it? Not fearing the wrath of the king. If we look back in the Exodus record, if we have time, look at the debates between Pharaoh and Moses. Moses is utterly uncompromising before the king of the world. We won't go there now because of time, but just quote to you some of these words. Here's Pharaoh. This is in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 25. He says, go ye, sacrifice unto your God in the land. He makes a concession, doesn't he? And what does Moses say in response? Verse 27 of Exodus 8, we will go three days journey into the wilderness. There is no compromise, is there? Pharaoh, Exodus 8, verse 28, you shall not go very far away. And he is standing here, isn't he, in front of the very king of the world, the very man who could have him put to death. And he doesn't give an inch, does he? He doesn't compromise at all. And again, perhaps we could look at Exodus 10. Pharaoh says, let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. And Moses in response, there's no compromise. We will go with our young and our old, sons and daughters, flocks and herds. What does Pharaoh say? He says, only let your flocks and herds be stayed. How does Moses respond, brothers and sisters? Our cattle also shall go with us. Not fearing the wrath of the king, brothers and sisters. Why? Well, the latter half of that verse 27 explains, doesn't it, quite clearly. Because he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, no man can see God and live, can they, quite literally? But it can be in our mind, can't we? Some sort of perception of the unspeakable glory of the Father. There was no concession to be made here. There was no way that he could compromise. And it's almost as though Moses there, standing before Pharaoh, saw above him the Lord God himself. The almighty creator of the heavens and the earth. The one who was really in control. And that is the point in the world around us today, isn't it, brothers and sisters? In the chaos, in the turmoil of those things that are going on. The world leaders think they're doing a good job. But you see, over all of this is the Lord God himself. We have to, as Moses did, endure as seeing him who is invisible. What a wonderful thing. Uh, and perhaps the words of Psalm 16 um, here can be of some comfort. Psalm 16 and verse 8, I'll read them to you. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. And they're highly appropriate, aren't they, here for this picture painted in Hebrews of Moses. Seeing the Lord God who is invisible, standing there above and in control of this man, Pharaoh. Uh, perhaps the words of, of Peter as well. I have set the Lord always before my face, he said. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself knew this, didn't he? He died at the right hand of God. He died right there on the tree with the father right there alongside him. 
And this was the fate of Moses also, wasn't it? It wasn't the same, but it was the same kind of fate, wasn't it? And he saw God was close to him. Verse 28 then of Hebrews chapter 11. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Did you notice something there, brothers and sisters? I'll read that to you again. It's striking when we pick this out. He kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Do you see that, brothers and sisters? What the record in Hebrews is telling us unequivocally is that although all Israel kept the Passover, really he did. It was Moses who kept the Passover. And then verse 29, by faith we see they passed through the Red Sea. But it began with Moses, didn't it? He kept the Passover. He laid down the instructions for the people given by God. He supervised the whole of it in a way. He was the the inspiration for those people to keep the Passover. And it's a subtle point, isn't it, brothers and sisters? But when we see it in the context of him as the type of the Lord Jesus Christ, look at these words in in Romans chapter 3. Keep those words in mind. Come with me to Romans and chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And verse 23, we're acutely aware of these words, aren't we? Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There in principle is the individual keeping of the Passover. Indeed, all have come short. All have fallen short of that great glory of God. And then scan down while we're here in Romans chapter 3. Uh, Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. It's his blood, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Just as Moses, he kept the Passover. And what is wonderful here, that word remission in verse 25 of Romans chapter 3 literally means to pass over. It's the only place that it occurs in the the New Testament. Uh, The picture here is of the passing over of sins came about through the declaration of his, that is the Lord Jesus Christ's righteousness. And all have fallen short of the glory of God. And it's he who it was who cleared it, but by his blood. And if we translate that back, we realise that perhaps Israel's faith would not have got them out of the land. He kept the Passover, Moses. He declared the righteousness of God, of course, didn't he? Through the action of Moses, he that destroyed the firstborn didn't touch them. And we note with interest, don't we, the concept there of the firstborn. The firstborn carries import, doesn't it? It carries the intention of other children to come. Let my son go, Israel, my firstborn. And Pharaoh, in standing against that, stood against his own eternal welfare. The Lord God was building a family, wasn't he? Of whom his nation could well have been part. But they were unworthy of that, weren't they, in the end? The people were delivered by the God, of God by Moses. Born of God by faith. And he stood, didn't he, as the type of that great firstborn. Christ, the great firstborn from the dead. Without him, none would come after, would they? Moses' faith that he could be a type of the Lord Jesus Christ was strong, wasn't it? Through whose faith the whole nation could be brought out of Egypt, out of the world. 
were baptised in the sea, just as we have been. And just as they were, brothers and sisters, as we sit here this evening in the chaos of the world around us, we know that we are moving onwards to the promised land.